Kelly and I'm a sophomore. I'm Anna, I'm a senior and I'm one of the co-captains here. Hi William, I'm a I'm a board holder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Allison, I'm a senior, I'm also one of the co-captains. I'm Natalie, I'm a junior. I'm so happy I'm a freshman. And you have a team member in the back who's also... Another board board. Board. Who's another Emily. board holder? Hi. I'm Emily, I'm a senior, I'm also a board holder. Oh yeah, yeah. seniors. Yeah. 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 Who's the seniors of board holders? Yes. Okay, let's go. Lexington is a suburb just west of Boston and has 16.5 square miles of land, 0.1 of which is water. There are 1,300 acres of conservation land with 26 conservation areas that have trail access. Although there are very few undeveloped plots of land in Lexington, the tree canopy is extensive and consists mainly of oak, birch, beech, and maple. These trees provide greatly to the, like, they provide food sources for woodland animals and habitats for tree growing creatures. So there, they also contribute greatly to the urban tree canopy, and the urban tree canopy is dominated by Norway maple, which is an invasive species. Invasive species are non-native species that spread in a certain area to a degree that is believed to be harmful to the environment, native organisms, or humans. So some of the main invasive species in Lexington, as you can see on this board, is multi-flower rose, oriental bittersweet, buckthorn, black swallowwort, fireberry, purple loosestrife, Norway maple, Asian honeysuckle, garlic mustard, burning bush, Japanese knotweed, and other exotics. So invasive species, um, um, most of these were introduced as ornamentals in the 19th and 20th centuries. However, they were not properly managed and they spread to the natural environment when their seeds were carried by birds and other wildlife. So as you can see on this next floor, this is Lexington's development in 1930 and um, in this patch of land here it's not developed. In 2013, in the same area, it's developed for housing. So over the course of 83 years, Lexington has become increasingly more urbanized. 50 years ago, Lexington was a small farming community that consisted mainly of farmland, forests, and marshes. Most of the forests were cut down and the marshes filled in to make room for housing. These alterations to the land made it easier for invasive species to take root. Bittersweet has taken over some of the few remaining plots of land and it strangles mass producing trees, while garlic mustard has crowded out native grasses. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts passed legislation as of January 1st, 2009 that bans the import, sale, and propagation of 140 non-native species. These species include Norway maple, multiflora rose, burning bush, and many of the Asian plants. Despite the value of native flora in Lexington and the laws that protect them, Lexington natives face serious issues. To counter this, we have compiled information on issues we've had in the past, current problems, and specific solutions to these issues. So in the past few decades, Lexington has had a variety of environmental issues due to recent plants. However, due to the efforts by Lexington's residents and organizations, many of them have been mitigated. Uh, one, of the, one of the primary organizations in our town that deals with invasive species is the Lexington Conservation Stewards, pictured here, um, which is part of the town's conservation department. Our town had the great pleasure of conversing with Mr. Jordan McCarran, who is the program coordinator of the LCS. Mr. McCarran's position is full-time and paid, which is a highly, which is a highly, uh, just, which is a highly uh, beneficial thing to our community in terms of race and species removal. As the program coordinator, his job is to improve and maintain conservation land. He organizes volunteers for specific jobs and also does maintenance with the seasonal land management crew. With his guidance. Many of Lexington's rampant species, such as, Japanese, such as Japanese knotweed and purple loose strife, have been eradicated from several select areas. One of the more major projects that is currently in progress is the restoration of the Ildewild Old Community Garden Site, which is pictured here and on the map. Over here is right here. Um, work at the site began in the fall of 2014 with the, remo with the removal of debris and has proceeded with the implementation of carefully selected herbicides and foliar spot treatment. Other, uh, other projects that are currently in progress by the LCS um, are those at Hennessy and Meadow, and these two will see more picture, these two respectively. Um, as for species-specific objectives, Lexington has been focusing its efforts on two invasive species in particular, black swallower and Japanese knotweed. As for groups that are unrelated to the official town government, Lexington has several all-volunteer groups that are committed to the environmental well-being of our town. Mrs. Alexander Doan, um, is one of our interviewees, and she is part of the Citizens uh, for Lexington Conservation. 
The CLC was established in the 1960s to advocate for the purchase of conservation parcels and has been active in the environmental issue uh, with the environmental issues in our town since. Uh, recently, they have been organizing volunteer crews to pull garlic mustard around select spots in Lexington. Mrs. Doan has been involved in the active in the active strategic planning of certain areas. For example, through the month of May, the CLC has organized garlic pulls around the areas of, Min of the Miniman Bikeway, Dunback Meadow, and Idlewild. These events are actually a result of the partnership between the CLC and the previously mentioned LCS and are a huge step in uniting the invasive species removal efforts made by both the All Town and the official the All, the all Town um, volunteer groups and the official town government. School communities have also in the past made progress towards the removal of invasive species. For example, Lexington High School's campus previously had a huge issue with the common buckthorn. Uh, to deal with infestation, our schools, uh, one of our school's clubs, the Eastgate Club, under the direction of Mrs. Nancy Sofin, would go out on a weekly basis and pull invasive species from around our school, such as uh, Bittersweet and Buckthorn. Uh, Mrs. Sofin and the Eastgate Club thus effectively kept the Buckthorn populations under a maintainable level for many years. Another part of our high school's activities that contributes much towards invasive species removal uh, is, is the five hours of environmental stewardship hours required for every freshman enrolled in honors or science. Basically what this entails is every freshman must contribute at least five hours of community service um, which is signed off on by an adult supervisor um, that goes towards the cause of, of environmental state sustainability. Uh, many students thus choose to remove invasive species to fulfill this requirement and this, their cumulative work accounts for a very large uh, beneficial force in our community. Furthermore, the science faculty and past environmental team coordinated a project about 10 years ago. Every year, the freshman class, about 500 students, would go out and pull invasives for one day. Uh, some of these species included garlic mustard, Japanese knotweed, Phragmites, and bittersweet. Phragmites in particular was difficult to remove due to the deep rhizomes, but um, there were efforts to track them, track them down into the ground several feet and remove them, which essentially eradicated them from our campus. Enormous amounts of invasives were removed and replaced with made of floor to prevent regrowth. The project was relatively successful. All visible traces of many of the species that we were worried about were gone. Um, this project also demonstrated that a sufficient manual labor force is sufficient for maintaining a manageable level of invasives around our campus. Uh, however, uh, this project stopped about four years ago, and the invasives have since then prolifer pro proliferated, especially around the wetlands around our school, which are extremely sensitive. Uh, this lack of long-term commitment is one of the several problems in Lexington that exacerbate the presence of invasives currently. As Allison pointed out, although Lexington has been relatively successful in dealing with many of the invasives, some issues still pertain today and continue to increase in fact. Numerous invasives such as the black swallowwort, Norway maple, oriental bittersweet, and purple loosestrip continue to pose issues. And it's unfortunate because a lot of the problem stems from a lack of awareness, and it's unfortunate that Eastgate, as Allison also pointed out, no longer exists at our school, which is the Freshman Invasive Species Removal Program. It was, that was a great solution that not only involved students from the school in eliminating invasive species, but it also eliminated the invasive species around the school. So we have black swallowwort and those other invasive species do continue to lower di biodiversity and forest productivity by outcompeting other species for resources and eliminating biodiversity. So the black swallowwort is c probably currently the biggest issue that Lexington faces because it is the most feasible economically to tackle. It is a vine that imitates the milkweed plant, which also lowers the monarch butterfly population because the black swallowwort does imitate the species of milkweed that the butterflies normally lay their eggs on, so they mistake it for monarch butter for milkweed and then they lay their eggs on that instead. And because the milkweed contains a specific chemical that the monarch butterflies need to make them unpalatable to other species, the larvae are not getting that, so they die. And that's contributing to their decline in population since 1995. So the black swallowwort is a vine and it strangles other native plants to death and According to Mr. McCarran, it is probably the most feasible issue to tackle in Lexington because right now the population is not so high that it is going to take up a lot of economic resources to tackle. And this is not the case with Oriental Bittersweet or Norway Maple, which are so prevalent throughout the community that we simply do not have the economic resources to go after these problems. The Black Swallower is at a level right now where if we do and take preventative action, it is definitely possible to keep it from ballooning into such a big issue as Norway Maple and uh, Oriental Bittersweet has become. So oriental bittersweet is a vine that strangles and overruns a lot of plants, so it's depicted right here. Um, it also overruns fence rows and roadsides and power lines, and it's just very destructive in terms of that. And it blocks light and pulls plants down and parasitically grows on them. 
It also spreads rapidly through the dispersal of its seeds through birds, which also makes it hard to control and it spreads easily. Another big one in these trees, which is detrimental to the ecosystem because the trees represent a source of food and habitat for many local organisms. Also, the wreaths of oriental bittersweet and the berries continue to be sold commercially, which only contributes to the problem. According to the Lexington Conservation Stewardship Handbook, Japanese knotweed and garlic mustard also are prevalent invasive species in Lexington. Japanese knotweed, as we discussed earlier, which is depicted again on that board, um, has very deep rhizomes, which makes it difficult to uproot. And it also lowers property values in Lexington because it is so difficult to remove. Purple loosestrife is another big issue in Lexington. It was introduced in 1756 and is surrounded surrounds the wetlands of Lexington. Currently, there are no native insect species that control it, and it produces many, many seeds, which makes it proliferate easily. And it forms dense, impenetrable stands that make it hard for native vegetation to grow. Uh, at Diamond Middle School, an initiative was taken to, Diamond Middle School is located right here on this map, an initiative was taken to introduce a species of beetle, not native, but, not, na not a native species, but it does eat loose stripe. So we can see here, here are some kids measuring the height of the loose stripe at Diamond when this was introduced. So this was done in 2002. It does raise an issue though because the insect species, Gallerosella, is also not a native species. So it does introduce some controversy there. Norway maple is another one of Lexington's major invasive species. Uh, it composes 18.54% of the local tree population, making it the most populous tree species in Lexington. It is not only a problem in Lexington, but throughout many towns in the Northeast. It is bad for forest ecosystems because other trees also struggle to grow because Norway maple is so dominating, and it has shallow roots that starve other plants of moisture. It forms dense monopritic strands that make it difficult for other plants to grow, and its heavy seed count and high germination rate make it extremely prevalent here in the area. It lowers biodiversity of the forest and forest productivity as a result. A lot of these problems that are a consequence of ignorance. So a lot of people simply do not know what these invasives are, and they just continue to plant them without realizing that they do pose a problem. According to Mrs. Doan, Nora Maple was originally introduced as a shade tree, and due to the dispersal of their Samara, a lot of them still remain today. It was also re-included as a protected tree species in March of 2010 by the town selectmen, due to the fact that they recognize that it does compose a major part of the Lexington tree canopy and needs to be maintained. So Lexington is very fortunate that we do have organizations dedicated to funding invasives, but as Natalie said, we do have issues and we can always do more. Chemical herbicides can definitely accelerate our progress, especially the Japanese knotweed, but we understand that many people in the town do disagree with that due to the lack of target specificity, the greater cost, and the work on licensing required. In addition, there's research being done on introducing predatory species to replicate the success that many communities have had with purple loose stripe, but we used to understand again that the introduced species can become invasive in of itself. This leaves us with the most tried and true, safest option there is, which is manual removal. With manual removal, we would like to target our maples, but at an average cost of $700 to remove and replace each tree, we understand that it's not really economically viable to do so at this point. In addition, our goal in Lexington is really just to control our current invasive population and to slowly chip away at the borders of really bad patches, although we would like to target the wetlands due to their sensitivity and the resulting benefits for our waterways and the watershed. However, community service is a big issue in Lexington. To provide that constant stream of volunteers required to do manual work, we do need to raise community awareness in Lexington. For a community that prides itself on our education, we are surprisingly ignorant of our environment. We seem too easily wrapped up with the faraway exotic issues like the Amazon rainforest, and while these are issues that we should get involved with, um, we fail to see the issues that are closer to home and to seize a chance to make a difference with our own hands. Lexington's volunteer residents are mostly older people, and we believe that Lexington's larger, younger population will be key in making a real difference. However, in the past year, we've seen a big decline in Lexington High School's involvement with the disbanding of Eastgate and the, an the termination of the annual freshman field trip. In order to combat this, we are currently working with the school to reinstate Eastgate as well as the annual freshman field trip. We do have plans for next year to do so. In addition, we're reaching out to the CLC to organize an educational presentation for our school. We are also asking our, 800, our 500 freshmen to uh, ID common invasive plants around their home with the target goal of pulling them. I also made a brochure here for them to look at and hopefully help them identify these plants. In this sense, although we do want to target wetlands and the waterways, um, as a community we really just want to cultivate a community sense of awareness of our environment. Okay, so there is no easy solution um, to the problem of invasives in Lexington. However, the important thing is that we continue to invest in the removal of current species and also uh, try not to let other invasives come into Lexington. 
thankfully, um, many Lexington residents are now becoming more aware of the uh, invasives around them, and there's also more uh, volunteers, enthusiastic of all ages. So with this, we are optimistic that Lexington um, is going to uh, become more aware and that uh, in the future, um, invasives will cease to be a detriment to local species and ecosystems. Wow.